Welcome to Mesa Now. I'm Chris Brady. And I'm Lily King Cisneros. On this episode, we're getting down to business. We're talking with small and large businesses in Mesa. And I'll take you to a place where you can get some delectable sweet treats. And also, I'll try my hand at hitting a few fastballs. Wow, that sounds fun. Stay right there because Mesa Now starts right now. Joining me now is Jeff Whiteman, CEO and owner of Empire Southwest, one of the top Caterpillar dealers in the world. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. It's great to be here. Oh, it's great to have you here. Um, I think most people know, but Empire Southwest is actually located in Mesa, Arizona. That's right. So tell us a little bit about, I'm sure people drive by, they, they drive by your location, they see your signs, you're pretty prominent. Tell us, what do you do? <laughs> what, do, is, what does Empire Southwest do? We do a lot. Uh, primarily, we are the, uh, we're the Caterpillar dealer for all of Arizona, a little bit of northern Mexico, and southeastern California. Okay. And so our facility on Country Club right. is our main facility, our corporate headquarters. Right. And we have our largest shops there, and most of the people uh, work out of that location. So your tell us what kind of who are your clients what, what is the typical i mean you probably have a variety but help us understand the type of clients right. you have so our clients range from somebody that's going to dig a swimming pool all the way to the large mines wow people that you know take care of the garbage prepare uh, subdivisions we have on the engine side of the business we have uh, the intels ebay's at&t's our engines suck the water out of the uh, out of the freeways when it rains real hard right, and, right, and right. things like that. So it's a very diverse uh, business that we're in. Very good. Now your business has also been in the family for quite a while. That's so right. give us a little bit about a little history of that. Yeah, I'm a third generation. Right. And uh, I guess the odds are I'm the guy that's going to screw it all <laughs> up. So, <laughs> well, you're, so you're doing a lousy yeah. job of that. You're doing very well with the well, business. Well, you know, it's because we have such great people. Yeah. You know, we really do. And our my grandfather started the business up in Eastern Oregon. Oh, and the okay. name Empire really comes from a wheat farming community called the Inland Empire. Oh, okay. And, uh, so that's where it comes from. It's not about domination. <laughs> I thought you were just in control of everything. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. no. And uh, he moved down in 1959. Okay. The company was actually started in 1950. Okay. And we moved to Mesa in late 60s. All right. Yeah. Okay. So then that's your grandfather. My and then, grandfather. And then your father. And my father was running it for, for a while. while. And, and then I've... Uh, You've been, been in, how long have you been now? The guy? The guy. Since uh, 2002. Okay, well, that's still a long time. Yeah. And your father just recently was also honored as, a, right. as a Mesa Man of the Year. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. So not only, and I think this is a part, I mean, well, I want to talk about what Empire does as a company and y your service and your clients, but Empire has always been a very big part of the community in general and participating in a lot of different areas. Um, and your father certainly has, was recognized for a lot of the work he did, but certainly under the Empire Southwest name is, is very you know, my, important. My grandfather really started that. He okay. was big in giving back. Oh, very good. And uh, taught that to my dad and he's taught it to me and I've taught it to my kids that we have a responsibility to give back to the communities which we serve. Right. You know, and and if you're fortunate enough to have a, a strong, thriving business like we do, mm -hmm. you need to give back and you need to do your part to help other people. Yeah, well, and I know that's been a big, uh, it's really helped Mesa in a lot of different ways, a lot of nonprofits and a lot of organizations. Yeah, thank you. So, so now, um, a couple of months ago, I had the opportunity to do a tour of your facility, of the expanded facility. So tell yeah. us, there are really exciting things going on there. So talk to us a little bit about what the new part of the business or the expansion yeah. is related the expansion to. expansion is about 100,000 square feet in total, about 80,000 square feet of shop, and then the rest is office space. But we're in a tough business. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we have a lot of pressure on top from our competitors and our clients saying, look, you know, they're, they're in a tight business as well. Sure. So we have this price pressure on the top. Mm -hmm. We have manufacturers like Caterpillar wanting to push. Right. And we get squeezed in the middle. Right. And so we realize that we need to make a change. And so what we needed to do is to figure out how do we rebuild, and that's what that facility is, is mm -hmm. a rebuild facility for right. all of our engines and com different components. How do we rebuild them faster, more efficiently, and as good, if not better quality? Mm. and not charge anymore for it. Wow, yeah. wow. That's, and so to do that, you've got to do things differently. Right. And so we took the best and brightest that we had at Empire, we got them in a room and 
many, over many, many, many meetings, sure. figure out how are we going to do this. And then when we got the plan, then we decided, well, now let's go travel all over the world right. just to get a little reality check and right. see if there's anything better. Right. And so we brought all that information back, and then and that's what we've got now today. And it's really it's an exciting facility. It's a state-of-the-art, and we're, we're very, very excited about yeah, it. Yeah, that was the exciting part. We were talking to one of your architects, designers, and he says, yeah, I got to go on trips to South America and all yeah, over to learn right. about best practices and uh -huh. how the design of facilities and things like that. Yeah. And what was amazing to me is just how the technology now available. It allows you to monitor equipment and a piece of equipment remotely and right. kind of see how they're performing and be able to be better address the needs of your clients that That's way right. too. You know, data analytics is a big piece of what we do. Right. You know, at the end of the day, our job is to help our clients run their businesses better. Right. And right. so to do that, you know, we have got to put a lot of tools in place and systems sure. in place to do, make that happen. But it's important to understand one: where where are your machines, mm. and how well are they being utilized? Right. What's their fuel burn? What's their idle time? You know, and there's a there's a long list of things. On top of what's the what is the machine telling you? Right. Is it starting to get an ache here, or is it getting hot here? And then, okay, mm. if it is, why is that why happening? Is, what's going on? And then go get in front of it before you have a, a failure. Wow, that's just amazing how far along that technology has come and that data-driven decision-making mm -hmm. that you guys are involved in. Well, we're thrilled to have you in Mesa. Tell us a little bit, kind of the employees, how many employees you have, and kind of what's the mix of the types of jobs that you would have at, at your facility. You know, we're fortunate to have nearly 1,600 employees. Wow. And they're yeah. the, the men and women of Empire are fantastic. You know, they're hardworking, values-driven people that wake up every day trying to do the best they can and try to be better day after day. Mm. And so it's, it's created a real culture of, of family, mm. respect, integrity, but also excellence and working hard and, and really being proud of, of what you're able to do. Sure. And uh, we're always looking for more. <laughs> you know, we're, Good. We are, we're growing, and we think the economy is... It's slowly starting to move. Okay, that's we fine. like it to move a little faster. We all would, yes. But uh, you know, we think that the future is bright, and that's how we're looking at it. And so we're we're continuing to look for good people. Primarily, uh, we look. We have most of our people are mechanics. Okay. Or that, or people in support areas that support the mechanics. Okay. So you've got different logistics, trans from transport drivers to actual technicians to parts expediters. And then we also have our sales teams, the credit sure, teams, you know, sure. all the back office Back office stuff, helping yeah. out. Great. Yeah. Well, Jeff, this is exciting. We're, we're glad to recognize uh, Empire Southwest and Mesa. I think you're a pillar of one of the great businesses that are here that we like to brag about. And you do so much for our community. So we appreciate yeah. you coming well, in today and talking much. a little bit about it. Yeah, so again, we want to thank Jeff for coming in and spending our time. Congratulate Empire Southwest on their expansion. Uh, Lily will now take a visit to a new pie shop in town, Pie Fection. I'm here with Cheryl Standage, owner and pie creator of Pie Fection. Welcome, Cheryl, to Thank our little you. program. So tell me a little bit about Pie Fection and what you guys do over here. Well, we make just pies. We have over 50 varieties of dessert pies, and then we have five different varieties of savory pies and three varieties of quiche, and that's all that we do. But we make them all from scratch, every day, freshly made, and we make them from the finest ingredients that you can find. For example, we use only real whipped cream in all of our cream pies. We use real butter in all of our crumb topping. We use our chocolate comes from Belgium. We import our chocolate wow, from Belgium. Nice. And all of our fruit for our fruit pies is it comes from the state in which it's best known for. So, for example, our peaches come from Georgia, our cherries are from Michigan, our apples are from Washington, and our blueberries are wild Maine blueberries that come just from uh, the wild parts of Maine. That's awesome. So what made you decide to open up a pie store? It's kind of unique. It is. Well, it's got a great little niche here, and we've been so happy that we've been very successful, and we've, we've been able to bring in people from all over the valley and outside the valley as well. So have you always been a baker, a pie maker? My entire life I've been a foodie. That was not my career. My career was I was a vice president with a bank and when I left there I, I uh, kind of took a few years to figure out what I wanted to do and delved into the food business and here we are three years, almost three years later and loving every minute of it. That's great. And so what made you decide to locate here in Mesa? 
Well, this is where I live, so that's a big part of it, but also there happened to be a pie shop here before, so all the equipment was where we are now, so we were able to just open it here where the equipment was, and it's been a great location for us, and Mesa has been very good to us. So what does your average customer, what does your average customer come in here and select? I mean, you have so many different pies to choose from, sweet, savory, um, pie of the month, you know, what do they come in here and, um, and want? Or do they just say, Cheryl, pick one for me? Well, a lot of times they do say, what do you recommend? Um, but we, we have, a pie, like you said, we have a different pie of the month every month, and we usually don't repeat those pie of the month either, so it's always a new pie. A lot of times our, our loyal followers come in and they want to try the pie of the month. They want to try something new. It depends on the season though also. Strawberries are just coming into season so right now we're having a lot of requests for fresh strawberry pies and also strawberry, fresh strawberry cheesecakes. Oh yum, that sounds great. Of course at Thanksgiving we have a lot of requests for pumpkin and um, pecan. Those are the, the favorite around that time of year. Um, I also did see on your menu you actually um, alter certain recipes to make it gluten free. We do. So we have three, four different offerings of gluten free. We can make that in coconut cream, chocolate cream, banana cream or apple in gluten gluten free. We also have no sugar added, so we have a no sugar added peach, no sugar added cherry, and a no sugar added uh, apple. So there's no excuse, you can get any sort of Absolutely. pie you want custom made. And you. if you don't want sugar, we have savory pies. We have uh, five different types of savory pies. We have turkey pot pies, chicken pot pies, uh, green chili pork, which is my personal favorite, mm -hmm. and then we have a beef pot pie that's in a marinara sauce, and a pizza pot pie. So those are all very popular too. So thank you, Cheryl, for taking your time and showing us around. If you're looking for any decadent, sweet, or savory pies, come down here to the pie section located here in East Mesa on Power and Brown Roads. Welcome back. With me now is Brian Fawson, General Manager of Special Devices, Inc. Welcome, Brian, to the show. Thank you, Mr. Brady. It's great to be here. We're glad to have you. Now, not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, we had a major announcement out at SDI. The governor was there, a lot of dignitaries. So tell us what's going on with SDI right now. Yes, sir. Uh, SDI is uh, in a position to grow the company. We're right. uh, actually moving from out of, uh, well, not out of the initiator business, but we're expanding our initiator business, our automotive uh, initiator uh, business uh, one step up the supply chain to the inflator level. Okay. So we're actually going to start building automotive inflators. Uh, we hope to start in January of uh, 2016 here. Okay, so Brian, help us understand, for those of us who are not real familiar with what SDI does, talk about the initiator, what that, what does that product play inside of a, a variety of different products, and then maybe specifically if I'm a consumer, where does, what role does this pl part play in the products that I might be buying in the future? Sure. SDI has been building automotive initiators since the late uh, 1980s uh, when airbags initially became popular. Okay. The initiator is actually uh, uh, what starts the ignition train of the automotive airbag, which deploys the bag in the vehicle. Okay. Uh, every time you turn on your, your vehicle and the diagnostic testing, uh, for your automotive airbag takes place. It's actually uh, an electrical signal that's run through uh, SD, SDI's automotive initiator okay. that actually senses on whether your airbag is in good shape or not to, oh, okay. to deploy. Okay. So uh, we get tested every time you turn on your car and, <laughs> okay. and uh, we're required to work for 15 years in the vehicle. So wow. it's a, uh, basically a life-saving device. We've been credited with uh, saving greater than 49,000 lives wow. uh, since uh, uh, we became a company and started supplying initiators. And now we're excited about the opportunity to start building inflators. So now the inflators is another, the next section of the, or next part of that. So it actually allows for the airbag to deploy. Is that what it's exactly. doing? Exactly. The inflator, uh, uh, there's gas generate stored in the inflator. And the initiator is just like a little blasting cap that right. propagates and, and actually ignites the gas generate. So there's a larger quantity of gas generate in the inflator versus just a small initiator. Mm. And uh, the gas generate is just a, uh, uh, basically a flammable solid, uh, a very safe component in right. the inflator, uh, where the initiator is a little more aggressive. It uses a... Uh, uh, ZPP formulation, which is a 1.1 explosive, just a little bit more aggressive than the gas generate, but it uh, 
uh, together. They make a very safe uh, 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 product that is capable of saving lives. So ultimately it's getting and deploying that airbag that will save a person's life, is exactly. that right? Exactly, yeah. Now, so talk to us um, currently today about how many employees do we have out in, in Mesa at SDI? Uh, currently at SDI, we have 390 employees. Our corporate headquarters in uh, Simi Valley, California, we have an additional 13 employees at our corporate headquarters. Okay. And our plans for expansion, uh, we hope to hire uh, at, at least 175 people before January uh, of 2016 here. So in the oh. next uh, seven or eight months, we'll be actively uh, recruiting uh, engineers, uh, supervisors, production employees, uh, technicians. So, okay. uh, so those are the kind of jobs you're going to be looking for to bring into Mesa? Exactly. Now tell us a little bit about your location, generally where you're located. Uh, we're just off of Greenfield and uh, North 202. Okay, good. So uh, we're on, uh, uh, if you, uh, just a block uh, south of the 202 is Virginia Street. Yep. And we're right there on Reseda Circle. Yeah, great views, of, great views of the Red Mountain. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, just share with us why uh, the decision to expand in Mesa. Well, we were purchased by Daiso Corporation, a Japanese corporation that's been around for a long, long time. Uh, back in 2012, uh, they are, uh, they were currently, uh, they're currently number two in the inflator business. Hmm. Uh, uh, they were number three. They're they're continuing to grow and <laughs> expand. Up, okay. and they had aspirations of uh, building a uh, another North American factory, and they had selected Mexico, and uh, we uh, worked pretty aggressively in, in in our discussions and put together the cost models and stuff, and and kind of showed them that uh, Mesa was the place to be. Excellent. And uh, based on you know the synergy and the uh, with SDI being you know, adjacent to our, our uh, inflator factory, our future inflator factory, mm -hmm. and with the experience levels and the people, the resources here in Mesa, it's just a great fit to put the operation here. Great. Well, Brian, we are really thrilled that you decided to, one, be in, here in Mesa for many years and continue to expand, and we wish you all the success to your company and all your employees, so thanks for being here in Mesa. Thank you very much. Mesa has always been a, a great city to work in, and, and we appreciate all the help that the city has given us throughout the years. Good. All right, we want to thank uh, Brian for joining us today. Lily now takes us to a place where you can sharpen those baseball skills and get one-on-one -on -one instruction from the pros at Extra Innings. So we're here at Extra Innings, and I'm here with Tim Unruh, a hitting instructor at Extra Innings. So Tim, tell me a little bit about what this place is all about. This place is all about baseball and softball, and uh, that's pretty much it. Um, we do everything here as far as training, do camps for kids. Uh, we have a softball facility over here that, that we have 80, 90 year old guys coming here to train for their men's leagues. So, uh, this place is, I call it Disneyland for baseball and softball lovers, so we, we have everything here. This is great. So typically, what does a day, average day look like? You know, how many, how many lessons are coming through? How many people are running through? You know, what does it look like? Uh, I think on, on average, I probably have about five lessons a day. So I'll, I'll sit in these tunnels and we go 30 minutes per kid with a lesson. Uh, we'll play games and I'll teach them mechanically how to hit or field or whatever. Uh, we'll have teams come in here and do their team practices here. Uh, they'll usually do like an hour training and usually at night this place is packed, it's loud and there's kids everywhere and baseball's being hit and softballs and uh, everyone laughing and having fun. We got music going so it's it's a good atmosphere to, to just kind of come and blow off steam or, or train to, to get to the next level. So I'm going to take a little preview and see what Extra Innings is all about. You know, Tim's going to show me how to hit, maybe pitch, maybe catch and I have zero baseball experience. So we'll see how Tim really, you know, see how good Tim really is. <laughs> She'll be a pro in 20 minutes. I hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so bend at the knees, elbows in a little bit. Look at that. You even twisted the back foot. Did I? Yeah. Hey. Perfect. You're an awesome coach. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you see the numbers on the back screen? Okay, If sure. you can hit the ball to the back screen, you get points to hitting okay. it all, all the way in the air. 
Very nice. This is a lot of fun. So coming from the professional background, being able to pass on some really good knowledge to these kids, uh, that's really what you're giving back to the community and to these kids, right? Yeah, you know, and, and the reason I love to do that is because with my background, I had so many people, now that I look back, that helped me, that didn't need to help me, and they, they just did it out of the goodness of their heart, or maybe they saw something in me. And, uh, they, you know, they, they, they took time and, and, and helped me. So for me now to, to have gotten this education and the background that I have, and now I'm able to pass it on to even my kids and, and other kids here, uh, honestly, I'd leave here every night feeling good. I, I really do, and I, I feel like I'm making a difference and, and hopefully helping some kids live their dream. And when you love what you do, it's not work. It's not work at all. This is play. This is, this is fun. Baseball's a game. And if, you, if you're not smiling when you come in here, I promise when you come see me, you're going to be smiling when you leave. So what are the, some of the other things that you guys offer here? I know that the outside there is like a storefront. If you need equipment or other things like that. Our, our goal here is, is just to provide every aspect of sporting equipment, uh, team sales. You can order your uniforms here and have them printed up. And we got a screen uh, printing shop back there. So we're, we're just kind of getting going with everything, but, but it's growing rapidly. Uh, so there, anything that you need for baseball, softball, umpire gear, uh, pickleball, I mean, any, 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 yeah, any sport that you can think of, we have supplies for it. And if we don't, we'll order it. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So the next time that you're interested in either taking a lesson, getting your sporting gear, you need to come down here and check out Extra Innings and ask for Coach Tim. Joining me now is Oakland A's Director of Minor League Operations, Ted Polakowski. Welcome, Ted. Thanks, Chris. Now, this has been a busy, this is a busy time of the year for you, so we appreciate you taking time to come visit with us today because we know we're in the middle of a spring training. Um, so there's a lot of things been going on, a lot of kind of new um, facilities and everything for the A's. But let's just start with the basics. Uh, when does you know, spring training really begin for you as far as when players start reporting and everything like that? Well, this was a, quite an interesting off season okay. with moving in and uh, right. getting set up and then letting players in the door. Um, normally, they're here all year. Oh, I mean, we've okay. got guys that are in town all year. So once the season ends in October, we start showing up first of November and then they'll start uh, yoga class once a week and <laughs> okay. get into uh, their off season conditioning and throwing programs and oh, okay. getting ready for spring training. At its peak time, how many players would you have at your facilities, do you think? Uh, between the two of them, player-wise, close to 200. Wow. Uh, between the Major League Club and all of our minor leagues, we're about 135 right now on, on the Fitch Park side. and another 50 some over at the major league side. Okay, so it's a lot of a lot of personnel while. moving in and out. Yeah, and then once spring training, we'll move them all out to their cities and then right. we bring a whole nother crop in. Very and we good. do it again in June, so it's a revolving door. Now, Ted, you've had a significant role from the very beginning about coming to Mesa, doing looking at the renovations, uh, overseeing the um, renovations of the facilities. Give everyone just a little bit of a highlight. What's transpired? What's been taking place? What have you been doing for the last year and a half or so? It's actually the last two and a half <laughs> two, years. Two and a half, two and a half years. years since I sat in your office okay, the very wow, first time okay. that we went. I came and talked to you. Okay. <laughs> but um, it, it's been a wild project with, with um, as I've quote, been quoted many times, from a cocktail napkin to uh, <laughs> yeah. growing to uh, much bigger, larger, larger pieces of paper and yeah. uh, getting with architects and contractors. But uh, We've made a significant improvement to both facilities. Uh, ironically, some of the Cubs personnel have come back and said, why did we move? <laughs> and, uh, but um, you know, no different than uh, I think when people come to Hohokam, you know, yeah. the first thing you're first thing you're going to see is it's uh, it's either us or the Packers are playing because it's green and gold. It looks awesome. It yeah. looks awesome. It looks awesome. Um, talked about some of the. I mean, we've seen the aesthetic changes, the different colors and stuff at Holcomb, and obviously a lot of improvements there. But what a lot of the public probably won't have a chance to see. Talk about the training facilities because you've really done some nice things there and expansions. What what would you say are the most significant changes? Uh, other than just color and, and modernization, but as far as the functionality of the space. You know, it's um, what most people don't realize, especially here in the Valley, is that we're here 12 months of the year. Right. I mean, we have a, that's a 12-month facility, and we have quite a, quite a bit of people coming in and out and staying in hotels and doing all the above. But right. um, in regards to the facility itself, first off is square footage. I mean, we've got room, and we've got room to grow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're going to be here a long time, and... Uh, I've already been here a long time since I'm a Mesa resident. <laughs> yes, but, yes. Uh, um, ironically, it's um, 
Square footage is one. Right. Uh, amenities for the players for training. Um, you know, our business is getting players to the major leagues. Right. Um, so talk about some of those amenities because I don't think everybody would understand when you walk into a facility other than just you know your typical obviously the locker rooms, but you have just the physical therapy, the the hydrotherapy pools, and the workout areas. I mean, this is a and it and I find it not. I guess you would expect to see. You know the places where they can get um, the, the trainers can take care of the players and treat them for injuries or whatever in the hydrotherapy pools, but you really the, in this world today it's also about diet and nutrition mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even the um, it's not just a regular cafe. It's I'm assuming there's people nutritionists and everything that are responsible for the food that's made available to the players and everything like that. Yeah, it's a whole lot different than when I first started 30 years ago. Yeah. I mean, it was soup and crackers back then. <laughs> uh, now it's full kitchens. Yeah. Um, our strength and conditioning coaches, our athletic trainers, our doctors, nutritionists are all involved, planning menus. I mean, we're sitting in the wintertime. You're talking about what we do in the wintertime. Yeah. We're planning meals. We're planning, you know, bringing what players are coming in, what players are injured. We've got injured players here all year. Um, the Fitch Park facility will host all of our rehab players. Yeah. So you talked about hydrotherapy pools, um, just the amenities to keep the players on the field. I mean, as I spoke earlier, our business is to keep players on the field right. to get them to the major leagues. Well, the shorter we can, when somebody gets hurt, they all get hurt right. at some point in time, uh, injuries do happen, it's part of the game. But our factor is how do we get them on the field the longest and keep them there. Keep them there. And then when they do get hurt, how do we get them there? Get them back. Get them back and get them back on the field. Excellent. So that's where the facility comes in play in regards to our personnel that are there. We have rehab. We have a rehab coordinator. We have a rehab pitching coach. Mm. So even fine-tuning it down to right towards pitch counts, uh, full video concept. So you know, before and after, when they were prior to them being hurt, to what to how they're throwing now, so you look at comparisons. So there's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes, and a lot of things that most of the players don't even know that are going right. on behind the scenes sure. in terms of impacting their careers. Let's talk about the stadium real quickly. Um, you've done some great improvements uh, there, but just talk about the turnout, the response from uh, the people showing up. What's, what's your impressions been? Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I think we've... Uh, far exceeded our expectations and I'm sure in, in many ways the city's expectations. Oh, sure. um, you know, historically we've been in that 5,000 5, people range, right. give or take on our, who our opponents are. Uh, we're somewhere between seven and eight now. I mean, we're looking out, we're on pace for 100,000 people. And I don't think the entire time that I've been with the A's, which has <laughs> been 30 plus years, we've hit 100,000 right. in spring training. So. Yeah. Huge economic impact for us, for yeah. the city. I mean, it's just, it's been a wonderful experience. It's been a wonderful experience in regards to talking to people. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of people are married to that stadium and yes. married to the community, <laughs> which is. We love the A's, but they really love the stadium. It's amazing <laughs> um, how many Cubs fans or Padre fans or somebody wearing some other team's merchandise and. They love the stadium. Yeah. You know, and it's about they love the improvements. Yeah. The, uh, the scoreboard has been a huge oh, hit. Oh, it's the best scoreboard anywhere. You know, that's been unbelievable. Uh, the field itself, I mean, just in yeah. terms of how it looks, how it plays for the p players, just the amenities. Um, bringing Ike sandwiches in, you know, <laughs> who, which has been a yeah. Bay Area favorite that are here in Mesa, but they're out at the stadium and yeah. they've been amazing. So yeah. it's. Um, it's been a great experience for everybody, and uh, hopefully it continues for years to come. Very good. Well, we want to thank Ted for taking time to come out during this busy time during spring training. If you haven't had a chance uh, this year to make it out to Holcomb Stadium, next year you need to make sure you plan to be there. It's a great experience. And you know what? The A's are a pretty good team. So we uh, thank Ted for being here today. Thank you very much. Joining me now is District 1 Council Member Dave Richens. Dave, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me back. It's been a while. <laughs> it has. It takes a while to get around the whole cycle. Yep. So, Dave, uh, during March, you have one of the most popular districts in the world as far as where people come to visit. So let's talk about what's happening with spring training and the two stadiums that are going on. What have you seen? What have you experienced? What are you, what's going on out there? Well, lots of traffic, and that's a good thing. <laughs> I love it. I live about halfway in between both stadiums, so I hop on my bike and 
grab the kids and we ride over to spring training games. And in fact, we went over to a couple of games during spring break with the kids over at the refurbished Hohokam Stadium. Yeah. Watch the watch the A's uh, play over there. So it's been a, I think it's been a good success. Have you the crowd seemed like they're doing well at both at the, well the Oakland A's for yeah, sure. Yeah, a lot of good energy. You know what I'm I've observed is at Hohokam there's a lot of people that just can't let that place go. <laughs> they they really love it. It's got a great feel for for a small stadium and uh, a lot of good energy there. A lot of fans showing up to watch the Oakland A's. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of uh, fans from other teams. Uh, so a lot of Giant fans, mm -hmm. Dodger fans, Cubs fans that still love the park right. uh, coming over. And so it's been really neat to see. Good, good. Well, I think it's been a very successful year with the, both stadiums here in Mesa. I think yeah. that's awesome. So let's talk, let's go back kind of over where the um, the Cubs play in the Riverview Park. So rec uh, recently, the Riverview Park was rec got a special recognition. You want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, Riverview Park was named uh, by a, a group that evaluates such things as a uh, top 50 playground in the United States. Yeah. And if you've been to the park, the playground <laughs> at Ruby Park, you can understand why. Uh, I think it was actually named number 37 on the list. Oh. Uh, and they, of course, feature prominently in their photograph, our uh, climbing tower. Our climbing is, tower, uh, yes. Quite Quite Very popular. popular climbing tower over there. Yeah, you know, you go. It's an interesting chronology of of kids playing over there. They have playgrounds for for the younger set, two to five, and then a whole nother playground for older kids. And then all that the climbing equipment seems to be really loved by all ages. Yeah. Um, but you go there during the day, and and at different times, I see you see the young preschoolers and the kindergartners out, and then you start getting the older elementary schoolers, <laughs> and then the junior high kids. By the time you end the day, you have a lot of college age kids walking. <laughs> around over from ASU around the lake and climbing up. Yeah, yeah. Seems to be a great date spot. Oh, there you go. That's where, uh, good, that's what we need to get the reputation. <laughs> you have a date there at Riverview Park. No, and then there's, like you said, the lake, and there's always someone fishing there. They're playing in the, the turf. There's a lot of things going on. Well, other than the, there's a lot more going on in, in that area than just the park. We recently had a groundbreaking of an office building, and how's that coming along? Right, right. They're uh, pushing dirt there. They've done a lot of the underground work, and they're just starting to lay the foundations there. So for several hundred thousand square feet of office space, yeah. um, uh, a couple of identified users coming in already, uh, taking up one whole building, and then they're actively leasing the other. So that construction's coming out of the ground. It's pretty exciting. And then you have uh, the Sheraton Hotel near completion yes. right next to Sloan. Uh, park there, so that should be open sometime in mid-April or so. Yeah, so a lot of things still happening at Riverview Park. It's not done. It's still under a lot of progress, a lot of things coming up out of yeah, the ground. Rumor is that the developer of the hotel will start on uh, additional rooms uh, as soon as he's finished uh, with uh, his with current project. Current project, yeah. So, uh, so. He, he likes that area and is talking about it continuing to expansion. That's good. All right, well, let's kind of move broader from that. Um, Councilmember, you've been on the council now for how long? About six years. Six years? Six years, yeah. six years. Um, talk to us about your time on the council. What have you most enjoyed about the time you've spent on council? You know, uh, uh, for me, it's accomplishing little things. You know, uh, little pocket parks, the parks bond. I really, really am proud of the parks bond um, and seeing the reinvestment that we've made. I, I, get, I hear from families all the time that talk about the parks in their areas. That was really exciting. You know, little things like seeing our natural gas garbage trucks Mm -hmm. And the transition we've made there, um, we're starting with a, a one truck pilot. We, I think there's 11 in the fleet now, mm -hmm. and the, the goal is to have all 63 of our garbage trucks convert over natural gas. And it right. has environmental benefits, but also had financial benefits for us. So it's, it's things like that that uh, sometimes the public doesn't really see or realize the city's doing. But uh, I've really been impressed with the, the folks who work for the city of Mesa and how much pride they take in their jobs. And sure, we have missteps from time to time. But watching the performance of our, our police force uh, in times of crisis is impressive. Our, our response times with our fire departments, the, all those new fire Apartments that we uh, yeah <laughs> fire buildings yes. that we've we've built one of which you built the last... a park next to right right <laughs> so you know there, there, it's that kind of stuff that uh, really uh, as I wind up my council service uh, I get great satisfaction. 
Good. So, and like you said, you mentioned your service on council will be coming up here in the next uh, year, two years or so. Um, what are some things you're most interested in seeing happen in that short time that you have left on council? You know, I have a, a few projects. I, th I think continuing to increase our neighborhood engagement and make sure that neighborhoods are given the tools that they need to really control their own destiny so they can communicate with the city, hey, this is the kind of capital investment we're going to need back in our neighborhood. Uh, this is some of the safety issues that we're experiencing, uh, and we want to be able to fix those, whether it be traffic or, or, or other issues, uh, and just working through those, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the hard stuff, and that's the stuff that we've been slogging away at kind of behind the scenes over the last few years. I'm hoping to wrap up a few projects that, in that regard. Okay, good. Well, um, so when you, and you meet with your colleagues, you sit on, um, you've been involved a lot of national uh, boards and sitting National League of Cities and other things like that. So when you're out there talking to people, what is the thing you talk about that you most, when you want to talk about Mesa, what is it that you talk to them about Mesa that you're most proud of? You know, I, I really like some of the stuff that we're doing in our downtown. Mm. Our light rail extension it gets asked about a lot nationally. Um, some of the economic development that we've done, attracting, uh, you know, I think you have a guest on uh, for special devices, Apple, uh, the different projects that have happened from an economic development standpoint, get asked a lot about the universities mm. and how uh, that partnership worked to get Benedictine University and Wilkes and the different folks that have come uh, for part of that. Uh, so, you know, uh, those, those things, I think, laid the groundwork for the future for Mesa. What, you know, as the mayor says, next Mesa, mm. you know, increasing our educational attainment, having better access to jobs, more high skill high wage jobs in Mesa, all the rest of the stuff, the, the retail and, and the quality of life issues, they'll follow those things. If our residents have good jobs, they can make a good living and their kids can can grow up in Mesa. I've seen a, little, a lot of that in my neighborhood. Kids that I had as Boy Scouts 15 mm. years ago are coming back with professional degrees, a couple of, a, couple of kids, and purchasing homes back in the neighborhood they grew up in. That's a really healthy sign for Mesa. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Councilor, thanks for being on the show with us today. You bet. Thanks for having me. We'd like to thank Councilor Richens for joining us on the show, uh, and we appreciate all of the work he does. Thank you. With me now is Corey Garcia, and Corey is with the Downtown Mesa Association. Mm -hmm. Corey, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, give us, what's your title? What is it that you do with for David Short? Over I at am DMA? the marketing manager of Downtown Mesa. Marketing manager. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's good to know. So, tell us, as the marketing manager, what are some things we should be looking forward to happening at Downtown Mesa? Well, right now is a really exciting time in downtown Mesa. We're nearing the finish line for the light rail construction. We are doing a whole rebranding and revitalization of downtown. Um, and we're seeing a lot of interest from outside businesses and developers in taking part in that process and making their own mark in downtown. So we've seen a lot of businesses open already this year. We have two opening on Main Street, which are going to be a little cause for trouble for us this summer because we have a cookie shop, Smith Later Cookies. Okay. Um, they create these amazing amazing custom cookies. And then we also have Slickable's ice cream sandwich oh, shop. Oh, I see your problem. Yes. So they're coming from Tempe. They're opening their second location on Main Street. And okay. they have these insane homemade ice cream, homemade cookie sandwiches that are to die for. So definitely two things to try this spring. In so if you're looking for a cookie... <laughs> uh, you're hungry for cookies. Mesa, downtown Mesa is a place to come. Yes, downtown Mesa is getting sweet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. There's our new marketing director. That's good. Um, so other than just kind of what's happening immediately, talk to us about during the year, what kind of a special events do you work on? So we have a number of monthly programs. We have our first Friday's Motorcycles on Main. It's growing each and every month. We had about three or 4,000 people last month and expect even more with um, the coming months. We have Second Friday Night Out, which is an art walk with a different theme each month. And then we have started Third Fridays, where we bring in live entertainment and different kids' activities through different businesses along Main Street. So we're trying to create activity on any weekend night that you come to downtown. Well, except for Fourth Fridays, haven't we? Except for Fourth Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> we just throw in some random events on those, on those days. Okay. But we also have a number of um, signature events that we do. We just produced our first annual beer festival, which was a huge success. We had a couple thousand people come out, over seven breweries. We're looking at doing another one around fall time. Uh, we also produce a number of 
of other kids events. We have a Kidtastic event series, which runs monthly during the year and then weekly during the summertime. We do everything from record painting at Asylum Records to cookie decorating at Sweet Cakes to Zoo to You experiences at the museum. So these are super fun events that we get a ton of kids out for each month. And then they're free to about $10, depending on the activity. So, so. when you come to work, do you think of it as work or do you think of it as play? We like to party in downtown Mesa. <laughs> let me just tell you, we, we like awesome. to yeah we like to celebrate anything down here. So okay. it's more fun. Now tell me about drive-in movie night. What's that? Movies on Main. Movies on Main. Talk to me about that. So uh, one of the vacant property owners, or the vacant lot property owners, Brian Marshall. <laughs> I don't know how to word that one, but um, he he wanted to activate his vacant property. So okay. he decided to partner with Second Friday and has created a movie on main night. So basically we create an outdoor living room. Um, they show a different movie every month. They bring in popcorn and hot chocolate, and it's really taking off. We get a couple hundred people each month, and it's it's really a fun thing to add to Second Friday. So where's it at? Where do it they... is at the Silver Lot on Morris and Main Street. Okay, very good. Anything else we should know about what's happening? Let's talk a little bit about we're making plans for the holiday season. Do you yes. want to talk about, can we talk about that? Yeah, we can talk a little bit about okay, it. Okay, we won't go too far. <laughs> I know you're still working on it. But kind of what are some general plans that you're working on as we look forward to the next holiday season? So we really want to hit it out of the park. We know Mary Main was a huge event a couple years ago on Main Street, and we've gotten a lot of feedback that we, that the residents and employees and everyone down here wants to bring something back. So we are going to create a destination in downtown Mesa this winter. So every, every Friday and Saturday in downtown Mesa during December, we'll have some sort of activity going. We'll be partnering with the city and then also the Mesa Art Center to create different activity centers. So of course we'll have Santa Claus and a Christmas tree lighting, but we'll also have live entertainment, festival components, a winter wonderland in downtown that you can come and take pictures at, and then we'll also have a trolley system that will be transporting people back and forth to the activity centers and then also to the temple to look at the temple lights. Excellent. Sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, one last question. Okay. So now they're going to really put you to the test here because you are I'm the ready. marketing director for Downtown Mesa. Okay. So just this week, and I'm assuming you've seen it, we unveiled the new artwork at Center and Main. Yes, I tweeted about it this morning. So what, what are you calling it? That's what everybody wants to know. What are we calling it? So you are the marketing director, so no oh. pressure, but, but whatever you call it, I'm sure that that's what will stick. I'm not sure Someone yet. Someone says, okay, Corey, I'm going, what, what am I looking at? What is that? The cone <laughs> of downtown Mesa. <laughs> so you're stuck, stuck on this ice cream theme here. I know. So. It's, I'm stuck on the sweets right now. I can't get enough of it. So. All right. But it's pretty cool, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. No, it's awesome. It's, I think it's a jaw dropper. When I was driving in yesterday, I saw it for the first time, and I was like, oh, my gosh, what is this huge cone? But it's, it's actually it's really beautiful, and it's, it's awesome to see all these different art installations becoming a part of the light rail and, and other parts of downtown Mesa. So it's awesome. Very good. Very good. All right, we want to thank Corey Garcia for being here with us today. Uh, appreciate her, all the work that she's doing to uh, sweeten up downtown and bring a lot of activities here. Uh, we thank her for being here. So recently, there's been a lot of movement in downtown Mesa, especially with light rail, Chris, right? Yes, lots going on. The train's coming. Yes, the train's coming. <laughs> and we had an event not too long ago about the fourth milestone um, installation of light rail. Right. And there's kind of a nice story going along this, well, Each right? of the four stations, there's four stations included in this um, extension of light rail. Each one of them has a different theme. And there is, but there's an artist who's helping to kind of bring that theme out in the station. So uh, they each kind of have a different um, opportunity for public engagement. Um, and so, like you said, earlier we saw the one um, at Mesa Drive and, and Main, where it really talks about kind of a storytelling theme, storybook theme, with the idea that that's a place to talk about Mesa's history and 
teaching children about the history of Mesa. So there's some great panels. They're incorporated as part of the light rail station. So it's not really a separate piece. They're really blended in with the construction of the station. I think they're fantastic. This artist does a lot of work in kind of these public in civic places, um, but she's literally gone out and met with race Mesa residents to talk about the stories, the history of Mesa, and part of that will be available for people to read and experience on that station. And then just this week, we had an installation of a large tower, kind of had the different profiles of different people of Mesa. The artist had developed this concept where he, more than a year ago, I think was here, uh, literally taking pictures of Mesa residents, their profiles, and then he's able to create or fabricate that into a metal piece. And it looks like the end of a rocket ship, a cone, or whatever you want to call it, call it, that now sits on the end of the station at Center and Main, and literally almost fits right in the center of Center and Main Street, so it's a significant piece. And your photo or profile is on there, is it not? We, we don't know. Maybe. We haven't confirmed it yet. We're yeah. still, you know, You're still scanning. We're still scanning to see. Seeing. I'm but not sure a, I'd recognize it if it was there. It's a beautiful piece, though. It's, a, yes. it's, a, it's definitely, I, I assume it's going to be lit up from at night. In the so evenings, that they, yeah, they're still installing the light, the, the lighting that will light it up in the evening. So it'll be a fantastic piece to bring in kind of a piece that people want to come and see in downtown Mesa. And then we have the one at Country Club that kind of has, um, kind of resembles a desert plant coming out of, from the station there. So it's been really kind of fun to see the different um, themes or artistic contributions to the stations that fit well, that blend in with the work, but really kind of give a uniqueness um, and kind of a special attention to the light rail. So again, the impact of light rail, even before the trains yes. show up, yeah. we've really seen a beautification of downtown, something new in um, coming forth of this artwork into downtown. So it's really continued to make it a really special place. And we have the four stops coming from Sycamore, right? Right. So, so Alma School, Country Club, Center, and Mesa Drive. And Mesa Drive will have a park and light rot. There will be a, there is a, a lot that's under construction now for about 400 parking spaces where people can, if they are coming from the east, they can park there to take light rail. That's great. And then uh, I know people, even though that they are excited about this um, Mesa Central Line extension, uh, talks are still going on for extending it even further out east, right? Right. So the plans are, and we've gotten approval to, to start spending money to take um, the next extension from, uh, again, Mesa Drive in Maine and go further east all the way to Gilbert Road, another two-mile extension. So we're, we'll be working on that. We have to work on the design and getting the plans ready for that. So in the next two to four years, that then that line will come on board or come online. And I think that'll be really exciting for Mesa Absolutely. to be able to have that light rail go all the way in to Gilbert Road. Yeah, you just actually you tap into all of those other residents that live a little bit <clears throat> further out east. And just to think that they can ride from Gilbert Road go downtown to see a ball game, right. connect with all the other businesses or museums, even ASU. It's it's great. It's a great connector. Yep. No, a lot of fun. So light rail's coming, so we're yeah. very excited. So we had a very busy show today, a lot of great discussions with uh, large and small businesses. That's right. And we'd like to thank all our guests for appearing on Mesa Now. And if you have any additional information or your uh, questions, just look us up online at mesanow.org. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.